Variation is the spice of life, so let's spice it up in this lecture. I want you to be able to relate mutations in a gene to changes in the phenotype by looking at how genes affect RNA, affects proteins, and affects phenotype. Be able to list and define the three types of variation, G, E, and G by E. Relate phenotypic plasticity to fitness. Define gene duplication and be able to give at least one example. Maybe it's a corgi. So this and, of course, a pretty much good review of the entire genetics component of Bio 141. So let's get rolling. I'd like to start off with a bit of a review of the central dogma. So the central dogma is pretty straightforward. It states that you have a gene. Okay, let's break that down a little bit. A gene is a section of DNA that codes for a protein or codes for a trait. Usually the protein is kind of causing the trait. Now this gene is going to be under a certain uh, section of DNA called a promoter. And the promoter is where RNA polymerase is going to bind. And the promoter is under certain enhancers, which tells RNA polymerase when it can and cannot bind. If your body has a gene for hair, say, it is useful to have that gene under a promoter that is going to tell your body to make hair. But enhancers that tell the body only to make hair in certain places. You wouldn't want hair coming out of your tongue or hairs in the central, in, in your small intestine. So it helps to, although each cell of your small intestine has the gene for hair and has a promoter for hair, the enhancers for having hair are going to be turned off. In much the same way, your body is going to use these enhancers not only to tell where a gene should be expressed, but when a gene should be expressed. One does not develop a hairy chest until they've drank a certain amount of vinegar, because that'll put hair on your chest. No, it's a certain age, and preferably uh, not a lot of hair on your chest if you're a woman. It's just a sex-specific thing. And also, your hair might start developing at puberty and might start falling out when you get a little older. So these enhancers are age-specific as well. So we have enhancers telling when and where, a promoter that's going to help the gene get, ex get, promote, get expressed by allowing RNA polymerase to be attaching, and the gene itself. So a gene is much more complicated than just a strand of DNA that codes for a protein. Wow. And mutations in enhancers, mutations in the promoter, or mutations in the gene can all cause variation. That's the central part of the central dogma when it comes to how genes are inherited and how mutations occur. This DNA of that gene is going to be in little triplets. So that's how it re it's read. It's read in triplets. And that RNA copy of those triplets, we're going to get A for T, U for A, uh, G for C, and C for G. That's your, um, that's your code for RNA is going to uh, mirror the code for the DNA. And those mRNA codons are going to be matched by certain tRNA anticodons. Hopefully this sounds familiar from Bio 141. If not, please go review your notes from Bio 141. Or if you took introductory biology elsewhere, go review your notes from elsewhere. Or if you lack a book, um, feel free to just drop by or send me an email and I'd be glad to explain it in greater detail. But the tRNA is a little subsection of RNA that is going to be attached to a uh, an amino acid, and the ribosome is going to take these amino acids and join them together as it reads the mRNA to make a protein, which is then going to be folded and turned into a functional, uh, functional protein, which will have functions in the cells, which that function in the cell is then going to have a certain phenotype. So there we go, gene to phenotype. And do note, a mutation in an enhancer can cause a gene to be uh, to be expressed at the wrong place at the wrong time. A mutation in a gene that is going to uh, make maybe hair be expressed, the hair gene be expressed on your tongue is going to give you a hairy tongue. That's disturbing and disgusting, but it could be a mutation in an enhancer causing the gene to be expressed in the wrong place. Or you could have a gene that makes you hairy at, you know, all over your body at birth. That would be a gene expressing, um, being expressed at the wrong time. So, these kind of mutations are just as important as a mutation in the gene, which might cause a change in the protein. We're going to focus on changes in the protein for most of this class because they're simply the easiest to explain. So how are those instructions for making proteins encoded in DNA? Well, 
There are 20 amino acids, but there are only four nucleotide bases in DNA, A, T, G, and C. And in RNA, it's A, U, G, and C. So how do you make so many different proteins, given that there's only so many different DNA um, nucleotides? Well, if you were to say the number of different combinations of nucleotides, it'd be four to the end, because you have four types. So if you had four, if you each nucleotide coded for an amino acid, that'd be four to the first, and there would be four amino acids you could have. If each nucleotide coded, if two nucleotides together were read as a pair, you could have two nucleotides coding for 16. Three nucleotides will code for 64, so reading those DNA triplets can code for up to 64 different amino acids. Well, we have 20, and we need more than two nucleotides, because that's only 16, so it's three nucleotides, but that code is, as we say, degenerate. So it's a degenerate code, which means there are two different ways of coding for, um, let's say, two different ways for coding for uh, glutamate. And uh, those two different ways for coding for glutamate is GAA -G -A -A and GAG. -G. Now, some of these also code for a start. AUG is the start codon. It's methionine as well, so it codes for methionine at the start of an amino acid, uh, amino acid chain, i.e. a protein. And there are three different codons for stop. There's UAA, UAG, and UGA. Think of it as stop codons. You are awful, you are gross, you go away. That's UAA, UAG, UGA. And those code for a stop codon because they simply code for no amino acid. And when there's no amino acid, you attach nothing, and then you can't attach something to nothing, so your chain ends. Coding for one of these in the wrong place can be very deleterious to the protein, as we will see later. And here are the, the different amino acids look like. Uh, aren't they beautiful? So there are some nonpolar ones, some polar ones, and some charged ones. Uh, you don't have to remember those all for this class, but you probably will if you're going into medicine. So yeah, good, good thing to kind of uh, review, or if you're taking biochemistry, very good thing to review. All right. So what kinds of um, mutations can occur? Now, I'll be going over these pretty much assuming you covered them in 141, so this is a good time for review. First off, you can have substitutions. You change a single nucleotide and therefore a single amino acid. So we have uh, GAT, uh, the first, the top one says GATTAC, AGA, TTA, GAG, ATT, ACA, TGA. And that's going to code for um, an amino acid. A, a, an RNA that will be GAU, UAC, AGA, UUA, GAG, AUU, ACA, UGA. And that last one, UGA, you go away, it's a stop. Okay, so you're looking at your DNA here that's coding for a certain RNA. So here we have our, um, our amino acids on the first one, and we switched a, uh, that TAC has become a TAT. So it's going to be switching from a tyrosine to a tyrosine. So you can have this, because it's a degenerate code, several things code for the same thing. What you see there is tyrosine can be coded for by several different things. The UAU and the UAC are both going to code for tyrosine. So when you switch, um, when you switch these around a little bit, it doesn't matter. And that's what we call a neutral or silent mutation. So a silent mutation is also going to be a neutral mutation because it has no positive or negative effects. All silent mutations are neutral mutations. Not all neutral mutations are silent mutations. We'll circle back to that. Then you can get a mutation that causes a missense. So here you change the TAC to a GAC, and that's going to cause the tyrosine to be changed into an asparagine. So you've changed that first, um, that first um, nucleic acid. That's going to have a, higher, a larger effect than the last nucleic acid in a triplet. What if you get a TAA? So that'd be UAA, you, know, you are awful, and that is a nonsense mutation. It results in a premature stop codon, which cuts the protein off before the protein can be fully elongated. Okay, that's a problem. And often nonsense mutations are, are going to stop the protein from functioning. No mutations are anything that's going to result in a non-functioning protein. Missense, nonsense, or mutations affecting transcription. So anything that's going to affect transcription, like a mutation to the TATA box of the promoter that causes RNA polymerase not to bind, that's a no mutation. It's a non-functional protein because that would be a non-existent protein. Indels. These are especially problematic because we do read this with a triplet code. So if we add or remove nucleotides, we can set things off for the triplet code. 
Here we've inserted an AC. Well, now instead of reading GAT, TAC, AGA, now it reads GAT, TAC, ACA, and you're off there, which also is going to result in that UAG, um, or TAG as it's showing there, and that's going to be your premature stop codon. So that's an indel, and that's what we call a frame shift mutation. It's an indel insertion or deletion affecting a number of nucleotides not divisible by three, so it's not a codon thing. It's altering every downstream amino acid, and it almost always results in a premature stop codon. You can also have a deletion. And a non-frame shift is an indel when you have a deletion of three or an insertion of three. Anything multiplying, multipli eh, divisible <laughs> by three is going to be a non-frame shift mutation because you're not shifting the reading frame, you're merely taking out a few amino acids. In this case, we took out the arginine and the leucine between the tyrosine and the glutamate. So now we just have asparagine, ty tyrosine, glutamate instead of asparagine, tyrosine, arginine, leucine, glutamate. And that's going to be a non-frame shift deletion. That was a lot. And uh, you may want to review all of that. As you see, I didn't write things down because that is review. That is your Bio 141 review. And I may have covered uh, several different lectures and maybe even a full week of genetics. Um, if you've taken that class, that might be another good thing to review or your biochemistry. Essentially, I expect you to know all the different types of mutations. That's just uh, assumed knowledge for, um, for this upper division class. Now, let's get into the fun stuff. We're going to call this the G versus E, the genetics versus the environment. So variation can occur by genetics or by environment. We would say uh, nature versus nurture, perhaps. Maybe she, was born, maybe she was born with it, maybe it's Maybelline. Uh, basically, there are different ways that an environment, that an individual can be variable. Um, say uh, Van Gogh had only one ear. Well, that was an environmental factor because he was born with two ears, his genes code for two ears, but his environment caused him to uh, cut off an ear, which put, makes it very hard to put a mask on if he was uh, dealing with COVID times. So that's an environmental factor. But let's look at the genetic factors first. Your genetic factors are your alleles. So we have something called the phenothiocarbamide taste test. Phenothiocarbamide is something that some people can taste and some people cannot. If you have um, both versions of the gene that are PAV, then you can have, um, if you have those alleles, version of a gene is an allele, an allele is a version of a gene. PAV, PAV, so you have both dominant ones, then you're going to be able to taste phenothiocarbamide. And how intense it is just varies based on how people view flavor. Um, if you have one copy of the AVI, which doesn't taste it, then one copy of the PAV, then you're heterozygous, and you can taste it because PAV is dominant over AVI. If you have both copies of the AVI, usually you can't taste it. There's always that one guy who's like, I can totally taste it. He can't, but you have that one <laughs> way out there. So the PTC taste receptor is actually going to be able to bind phenothiocarbamide. So your PAV allele allows you to bind phenothiocarbamide. However, your AVI allele is a taste receptor. It's a protein that has been mutated in such a way that it cannot bind to phenothiocarbamide. And if it cannot bind to phenothiocarbamide, then a taste receptor can't receive the taste. Your phenotype is that expression. So you either taste or you don't. That's your phenotype. And that depends on the functionality of the protein, which depends on the allele that is present, which should tell you whether the right codons are in the right order coding for the right amino acids. Cool. There is genes to phenotype, and there's your phenotype is taste it or you don't. So your gametes, of course, are haploid. So how is this inherited? Well, you make your simple Punnett square. You have an AVI, PAV, heterozygote, and uh, reproducing with an AV, AVI, PAV, heterozygote, and one quarter of them are going to be AVI, AVI. Uh, two quarters of them, or one half of them, are going to be heterozygotes, and one quarter of them are going to be homozygous dominant. So you see how this is inherited. And of course, since it's a two allele thing, we can have your frequency of the AVI is going to be your frequency of the recessive allele, Q. And if Q equals 0 0.6, what proportion are not going to be able to taste phenothiocarbamide? That's right, that'd be Q squared. And that would be, that's right, 0 0.36. 
I'm just kind of saying that's right. It's like uh, Dora the Explorer. That's right. The map's behind me. Oh, yeah. That's a P, that's a P and Q question right there. And we will be doing some P's and Q's. So, you know, brace yourself. Henry Zagre uh, Hardy Weinberg is coming. Okay. Let's talk about environmental variation. That's the expression. Genotype by expression, by environment. So purely genetic factor is your G. So AVI and PAV, it doesn't matter how you were raised, you either can taste phenylthiocarbamide or you can't. Your expression though is gonna ma matter based on your environment. So here we have some tan lines from typical summer activities like computer programming, mountain biking, or water skiing. Those tan lines are variation caused by the environment that those individuals were in. And we're gonna start this off with something called inducible expression, which tan lines indeed are. Inducible expression means a trait can be turned on or off. And this is generally true if you have a costly trait. So in Daphnia, we have some spines on them on the back that make them harder for predators to grasp. What happens though, is these spines are costly in terms of mobility and in terms of resources allocated to grow the spines. At least theoretically, they're costly. So you will not, you as a Daphnia will not grow spines unless predators are present. Well, how does a Daphnia know predators are present? Well, it senses them by chemicals in the water. So releasing these chemicals into the water is going to cause certain proteins to bind to the promoter, and not the promoters, bind to those um, expression-specific areas of the DNA, which causes, uh, which causes the expression of the gene for these spines. So binding to those areas is going to cause, is going to, is going to make the expression of the spines, and these spines will only be expressed when the fish are present or the fish chemicals are present, the predator chemicals are present. So those spines are what's called an inducible gene. Nicotiana is a species of, um, oh, what's it called? Uh, it's a species of tobacco. So your, um, your species of tobacco is going to be only expressing uh, large amounts of nicotine in the presence of herbivores. Nicotine involves nitrogen, and nitrogen is costly to a plant that is living in sand. Uh, Nicotiana attenuata is a desert tobacco that is only going to express nicotine in the presence, of, only to express like any high level of nicotine. It's always at this low level, but it's going to spike that level in the presence of an herbivore. So Manduca sexta, the tobacco hornworm, is going to start chewing on this Nicotiana attenuata, and the Nicotiana attenuata is going to release jasmonic acid, which that jasmonic acid is a hormone. The hormone binds to a receptor. The receptor binds to a transcription factor on the DNA, which causes RNA polymerase to bind to the promoter and express higher levels of nicotine. Only in the presence of that tobacco hornworm, and that nicotine will theoretically drive the tobacco hornworm to go chew on something else, please. So the Nicotiana chemicals are what's called an inducible reaction because they are induced by the presence of this, um, of this tobacco hornworm. We also have something called the reaction norm. How much can you express? So we start the summer, um, our neighbors and us, we all start the summer kind of pasty and white after being stuck inside for the entire winter or even worse, being stuck inside during, uh, you know, really long rainy times and COVID and, you know, um, school and whatnot. So we all start about the same pasty whiteness. Now, how much we get tan is depending on our genes. So how much is that trait inducible is itself a genetic effect. So we talked about environmental effects and now let's talk about genetic by environmental effects. So our neighbors, some of them are, you know, Northern European descendants, so they don't get very tan. They get red, but they don't get very tan. Um, some of our other neighbor, neighbors have um, Native American uh, genes and a higher, and, you know, pretty high amounts, so they do get very tan. And we, as a, you know, our little family is mid-European and some Native Americans, so we get even, you know, we get somewhere in the middle tan. That how tan you can get is kind of your reaction norm. And that's how inducible a trait is. So this, you have this, uh, another example would be the SOX9 gene in leopard geckos. So the SOX9 gene is something that can be uh, determined by the temperature of the eggs. So how uh, the percentage male, uh, between 30 and 32 degrees Celsius, the eggs, if incubated in those temperatures, are going to be a higher percentage male, between, eight, between 75 and uh, 95 or 90% male, because 
high temperature sand produces male geckos. This is just how they determine what the sex is going to be. Your gender reveal parties for geckos are, are very temperature dependent. Um, but how much that can change between the 30 and 32.5 is going to vary based on the genes that the geckos have. So some of these are going to be changing from you know, a predetermined amount of, gecko, of male geckos to another, another predetermined amount of male, uh, to a higher amount of male geckos. And some of them are really going to change from zero to 100% male based on those environmental factors. So how, in, how much a gene can be induced, how much there can be a change in the phenotype based on changes in the environment is itself genetically determined. And inducibility varies by lineage. So some individuals are more inducible than others, and that is a genetic factor. So that's your G by E effect, your genotype by environmental effect. And we have a, this is called overall, you know, your plasticity. How changeable, how malleable are your traits? And phenotypic plasticity is itself under natural selection. So here we have that Manduca sexta tobacco hornworm, and typically, typically they're green. That's just the normal color for Manduca sexta. However, if they're grown in colder temperatures, they turn black. Uh, why do they turn black? Well, because colder temperatures are going to be um, are going to be bad for your caterpillar that is an ectotherm. So it needs to absorb more heat, and what absorbs more heat? Well, darker colors. You know, I, sh I should be absorbing more heat from um, a source of heat. If there was sunlight, I'd get warmer. And this black caterpillar, in the same way. But sometimes they get heat shocked. So let's expose this black caterpillar to too much heat. The next time it molts, it's going to be greener. Now, how much greener? Well, that's going to be, of course, a reaction norm. That is an inducible change. And how much greener is itself under natural selection for a caterpillar after heat shock to turn totally green is not the most common. So about 15% go from zero, which is completely black, to a three, which is completely green. About 15% are going to do that. Uh, close to 55% are going to turn one shade more green. And that is, um, that's the most common one. Now, what if that heat shock always was followed by high temperatures? Well, in that case, the ones that turn from completely black to completely green, green in a single molt, those ones are going to have the highest fitness because they're not going to be overheating. So under the environmental conditions that would favor a completely black to green transition, the individuals that turn from completely black to completely green, if that is their reaction norm for how inducible they are, those ones are going to have the highest fitness, and thus phenotypic plasticity will be under a high amount of evolution. It would be a great selection pressure for those highly inducible, very plastic caterpillars. Now, under normal conditions here, as seen by this population, it's evident that only turning one shade lighter due to a heat shock is most advantageous. So perhaps a heat shock is indicative of future temperatures that may be warmer, but not much warmer. So turning one shade lighter after a molt, and then maybe the next molt turning another shade lighter, that is going to be the most advantageous. So that's the most adaptive response that low phenotypic plasticity has been selected for in this population. And that really tells you, you know, phenotypic plasticity, how much you shift in a single, um, a single time or how fast you change, that's under natural selection. Okay. That's a fair amount of stuff on the G by E. G, genotype, E, environment, G by E, how much the genotype determines the environmental change. Is it always advantage to be plastic, though? Uh, why change and shift with every blow of the wind? We'll discuss this briefly in groups of two, but since you're online, I just kind of ask you to think it over. Give me an example when it's not advantageous to be plastic in the forum. And give me some examples of non-human Plasticity. Now, I want you to look up phenotypic plasticity to see what species can change. I don't want all the same to be Daphnia and Nicotiana and Manduca. Those are model organisms. Give me, give me some fun. Give me, give me, give me, you know. Find some populations that, that don't change. There are organisms that have no phenotypic plasticity. It doesn't matter what they're exposed to. They stay the same. And think. Think. You don't need to answer this one in the, in the forum. Why are these populations not plastic at all?
This is also a good time to put some questions in the forum. We've covered a lot today, and we're not done. <laughs> All right, let's discuss more types of mutations. So get back to that G and talk about the types of mutations that can be experienced. We're going to cover some chromosomal mutations. So we're going to move on from your bio-141 and your bio-395 all the way up to your, I'm oh, sorry, 375 genetics. We're going to move right up into your genomics. So I know we all took 141 or equivalent, and uh, you may have taken 375, but this is going to be some more advanced stuff. This is some real gourmet stuff right here. Mutations. And we're covering mutations not just on that um, deleterious, that, that, sorry, the silent mutations, the missense mutations, and nonsense mutations. Oh no, we're going to take this all the way up to the chromosome level. So let's go. Chromosomal. So chromosomal mutations are when a whole section of the chromosome may, um, may get switched around. So something, one example of that would be a crossing over, an unequal crossing over. You may remember during mitosis and meiosis, uh, during prophase one of meiosis, you have genes crossing over when chromosomes are going to form chiasmata and exchange genetic information. If that sounded a bit Greek to you, I've got a video for that. You can feel free to go scan on over, heck, you can pause me now and go on over to a meiosis video that I have on my YouTube channel. I like YouTube, it's kind of free. Okay, so during prophase one, one chromosome might give a bit too much, the other chromosome might get a little bit too much, and you have certain genes, you know, whole alleles being sent over, so you get duplications because one chromosome gets two copies of the allele for, um, for spine production in Daphne, and I have two copies of that allele for spine production. Well, you gotta think about what that could do. If you have now two copies on that, um, chromosome instead of one copy. Perhaps inducing both copies will make bigger spines. Perhaps they end up canceling each other out. That can happen too. You also have something called retrotransposition. If this were a genomics class, oh boy, that would be much more fun. The name is long and the explanation is far longer. And we're not going to cover it in great detail because this isn't really... Um, this isn't the place, but hold on. Okay, so retrotransposition is basically that your um, that certain organisms are going to transcribe a gene into mRNA, process that mRNA, and then make a DNA copy of the processed mRNA and put it in a new part of the genome. These are actually there are there are parts of certain genomes, like the corn genome, for example that are just littered with retrotransposons. So there are whole chunks of the corn genome that are just lifted out as mRNA and then are moved into a new part of the genome and then just dumped into a new part of the genome. And these, um, what happens there is these genes can be retrotransposed to be expressed under different transcription factors. So the gene for um, the gene for like a, a coloration gene, so something that's going to make, um, I'm trying to think of a good, a good coloration, a carotenoid perhaps. The gene for a carotenoid can be um, copied into mRNA, moved over into the seed kernel, and then dropped down to make orange kernels. Or the gene could be dropped, another gene could be dropped into another gene, thus giving an insertion that results in a non-functional gene. So these parts of the genome are just hopping all around, we call them jumping genes. And retrotransposition, if you go into plant genetics, you, you want to read it now, or it's going to be an unpleasant surprise later, but it is a really, uh, a really cool effect of genetics. So reverse transcriptase, basically moving genes around, can result in genes being duplicated, because now you have two copies, under perhaps different promotion, promoters. So what are the outcomes of this? Well, you, you had one copy, and now, through crossing over or through retrotransposition, you have two copies. This is common in evolution. So although I'm not going to really hammer down so much on the causes every time, I really want to cover out the outcomes. So a negative selection could be that you put uh, gene 1 exists, and then gene 2 
is a copy of it. Uh, maybe it's under the same promoters, but it's mutated. Or maybe it's under different promoters, which means it's at a bad time. It's expressed in the wrong time. So it's selected against and uh, individuals who have this gene 2 are going to be selected against. Perhaps gene 1, uh, it's expressed under certain promoters. Perhaps gene 2 is expressed under promoters that give the organism an overall benefit. So it's expressed under different promoters, or it's got mutations occurring to it that make it actually a better gene. So this is a more functional protein that's going to be positive selection for this duplicate. Subfunctionalization, perhaps mutations occur to gene 1 and mutations occur to gene 2, and they end up having two subfunctions. So you had a gene that slices and dices, you know, like you got a knife. It slices, it dices. Okay, you subfunctionalize it into two different genes, one of which slices really well, and the other of which dices really well, but the first one dices poorly and the second one slices poorly. So you have that kind of subfunctionalization within a gene family. Gene family, yes. When you duplicate genes it, and they derive from one another, it's called a family. Neo-functionalization. So mutations occur to one of the copies of the genes that gives it a new function. So perhaps you have these, you know, you have a knife, you duplicate it, you have two knives, they look pretty much the same. Then one of them is going to um, sub-functionalize, or sorry, neo-functionalize to be uh, larger and flatter. Well, now you can press things down with it. So you can chop things up and press things down or scoop things. Maybe it's a spatula now. We turn a knife into a spatula by flattening it and making it broader. Okay, cool. Neo-functionalization. Now, instead of two knives, you have a spatula and a knife because you've changed the functionalization of one of those genes through mutation. And then there's pseudogenization. Pseudo this is a bit weirder. You just mutate the transcription factors or the promoter, and now you have a non-functional gene. Or maybe it's going to have a premature stop codon. It's a non-functional gene. It's called a pseudogene because it still looks very much like a gene. So to someone who's sequencing the genome, they're like, oh, look at this. It's got promoters. It's got a... It's got transcription factors, it's got a Tata box, and it's got a poly A tail. That, that is, that's a gene there. Or Simmons, we found a gene. Uh, no, it doesn't have, it's got a premature stop codon. It's a gene, but it's not functional, so it's not really a gene. Oh, well, let's call it a pseudo gene. There you go. It's a pseudo gene because it looks like a gene to someone sequencing the genome. It's got functions of what, it's got the parts of it, but it doesn't work. Okay, so here's an example, it's an example of retrotransposition. Um, you have a retro-duplicated copy of FGF4, which is one of these uh, genes involved in long bone development. So your long bones, you know. And, yeah. What happens is if you have two copies, that ends, ends up giving the individual who has two copies, it gives them chondrodysplasia. So your chondrodysplasia has two copies, and you get things like corgis, because you have two copies of the um, gene for FGF4. It's a the problem is the gene got duplicated into a region with a different promoter. All right, this one's a bit confusing. So orthology and pyrology. I'm gonna actually give myself more space for this. So genes, if genes are going to be duplicated and the outcomes of evolution of gene duplications can cause orthology and pyrology. The rationale behind this is very evident, but the terms are a little bit confusing. Let's say you have gene 1. So gene 1 is a gene for, uh, for hemoglobin. Now you're going to have species 1, this is a fish with hemoglobin, and species 2, which is a fish with fins and hemoglobin. It's the same gene in two species. That's orthology. Same gene, two species. Pyrology is when you have gene one, it's going to turn into um, hemoglobin one and hemoglobin two in the same fish. Same species. So two copies of the gene in the same species are pyrology. It's pyrologous. So hemoglobin is a good example of this. We have 
the same hemoglobin gene as chimpanzees. That's orthology, because it's one gene in two species. Now there is something called a hemoglobin, there's something called adult hemoglobin and fetal hemoglobin. All of us have the genes for adult hemoglobin and fetal hemoglobin, so that's two paralogous genes because those are different genes in the same species. You had fetal hemoglobin when you were a fetus, you have adult hemoglobin when you were an adult. Those are paralogous genes. Now, a gene, that, what, they're, what I'm saying here, in, the, uh, in a much more confusing manner, but a much more relevant manner later on, is if you're looking at a whole tree of species and they all have the same gene, you're looking at ortholog an ortho orthologous gene in a whole family of species and saying these species are all related because they have orthologous genes. However, if you're looking within a single genome of a single species and you're looking at a whole bunch of genes that have themselves arisen through genetic duplication, you're looking at paralogous genes in a family. So these are two different types of evolution you're really looking at in two different ways. And you can cross the streams, but please don't until you until we understand these first. So orthology and paralogy, that is something that will be on the quizzes and tests. I do want you to understand the difference because you'll be referring to them later on. All right. This is something we're going to get much more in depth later. So I really want to set some good groundwork here. Loci and linkage. Loci, a locus, you know, plural loci, is going to be the physical location of a gene on a chromosome. Okay, so there is a gene. It is near the end of this arm of chromosome 1. That is its locus. It's a physical location on that chromosome where you can find the gene. If you have the ability to make a gene glow in the dark by attaching a protein to it, that is going to um, express uh, GFP, green fluorescent protein, you're always going to see that little glowing dot on the same chromosome in the same place. That is a locus. It is a location on a chromosome. Linkage is how close two loci are on a chromosome. So here we have an example with this chromosome, and A and B are close to one another. So A and B are close to one another. Cool. And that is their linkage. They're going to be tightly linked, which means crossover events are uncommon between two genes that are closely linked. Now, there is this possibility here of a mutation where the chromosome essentially bends around itself and you have this CDE in a certain order. The chromosome bends around itself, breaks and reanneals. That happens. And now you have EDC. So they've switched in order. Oh, dear. So let's look at um, some types of this uh, of changes of loci. The first one is an insertion. So perhaps a, a lot of DNA gets inserted into a chromosome. Perhaps this is junk DNA. So um, perhaps this is a viral genome getting inserted into a chromosome, and that's going to be an insertion. So now C and D, which were very close together, their loci were closely linked. Because of all this junk DNA here, you now have C and D being farther away, which means they are less linked. Duplication. Perhaps during reading of the chromosome, during the S phase of, my, of um, cell de development, they are going to read A, B, C, B, C, D, E. And that duplication is now going to make C and B uh, linked in a couple different ways. So you can see how C is now between two Bs and B is now between two Cs. So this kind of linkage is going to be a lot more complicated when you have a duplication event. And duplication events are very common um, in an evolutionary sense. Uh, deletion. So perhaps part of the chromosome breaks off, like in Credu Schott syndrome, where you have a, a break, uh, broken off part of our fragile X syndrome, where you have a part of the X chromosome broken off. So now uh, one of these copies simply doesn't have the gene for E. So D is no longer linked to E because E is absent. Then there's an inversion, which we showed earlier when this, you know, your breakage and reannealing. So now B, which used to be tightly linked to C, is now tightly linked to D. And C, which used to be tightly linked to B, is now tightly linked to E. 
So now this inversion has made these genes go into a different order, changing their linkage. Last is translocation, which is when a ch chunk of one chromosome breaks off and comes onto another chromosome. Uh, what this can do is you can actually have whole chromosomes linked to one another. An example of this would be between chimpanzees and humans. So what happens there is going to be our chimpanzee uh, has one more chromosome than a human because a whole chromosome got translocated onto another chromosome. There will be a test question asking you to know, list and describe five. I love li questions that say, hey, list and describe all five of these. Five points. Not here. Just be kind of familiar with these. We're going to come back to linkage later. So this is something to be familiar with in general, but I'm not going to ask questions on unspecific. All right. So what about um, duplicates? Let's come back to this just a sec. I wanted to point this out. Uh, that duplication, remember, now you have two Bs. There can be multiple different outcomes from those two Bs. You have two Cs, there can be multiple different outcomes. You can have sub-functionalization, neo-functionalization, uh, or pseudogenes coming off of this. So do note that duplication is going to cause paralogous genes. All right. Last would be a genomic mutation. which would be polyploidy. Now there's autopolyploidy and allopolyploidy covered in bio-142. Polyploidy is when you have a, an organism that is 2N and it's going to produce offspring through one way or another that are 4N. So the whole genome duplication or multiple gene duplications, yeah, so we're just going to focus on the whole genome duplication. And um, what that's going to do is now the organism, instead of having two copies of each gene, has four copies of each gene. This is notoriously common in plants. Not very common in um, animals, but plants, oh my, they love this. So here's a question. Does genome duplication increase heterozygosity? I want you to think of the effects of a mutation, and I want you to think about the effects of mutation accumulation. And I want you to think about heterozygosity through the next lecture topic. So through that next lecture, I want you to really think about those things. And then I want you to come back and ask yourself how genome duplication increases heterozygosity and may change um, the, uh, how many different paralogous genes are present. Okay? That was a real lot of material. I really urge you to kind of review it. I urge you to ask a lot of questions because I'm here for questions and don't feel like the questions are silly or stupid, okay? So I know a lot of people are thinking, holy cow, he just covered a month of Bio 141 and two months of genetics in one lecture topic. Yes, it's a lot. Ask me anything. I need to know what was unclear so I can help clear it up. I'm here for you. Your book is also a very useful um, source for this. And I would also urge you to go back into your introductory biology book. Hopefully you didn't sell it back and, uh, and take stuff up from there. So yeah, definitely ask some questions. That was a very dense lecture. And we're about to enjoy a less dense one, but still a lot more material.